Beyond TV UK. For the community, by the community. www.beyondtvuk.com Dear viewers, the world is changing every day with a new technology. At Beyond TV, we are now introducing for the first time in England live weddings and events straight from the venue and simultaneously from your house as well as broadcasting all around the world. Watch live on the day on our Beyond TV Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and website channel with all your family and friends around the world from the comfort of your own home. A great way to join in during COVID restrictions too. To make your day extra special, we can live stream using up to eight 4K cameras with live editing choice of your music and give you the complete edited film by the end of the day. To reserve your exclusive booking with competitive prices, please contact us now on email beyondtvuk at gmail.com, phone 0121 257 7007, mobile 078 আপনারা বলবেন আমরা শুনব রিয়াদাহাতের সঞ্চালনায় কমিউনিটির নানা বিষয় নিয়ে ভিন্ন মাত্রার অনুষ্ঠান আমিও বলতে চাই দেখুন প্রতি সপ্তাহে শুধুমাত্র বিয়ন টিভিতে প্রযোজনায় শিপন আহমেদ বিয়ন টিভি ইউকে ফর দ্য কমিউনিটি বাই দ্য কমিউনিটি অন্যায় অত্যাচার অবিচার Good evening and Salaam Alaikum. Welcome to Beyond TV UK. I'm your host for the next hour or so, Amina Begum, and I am joined in the studio today by two amazing guests, inspiring young ladies. And um, today's show is going to be um, discussions around women empowerment. So I'm not going to introduce my guests. I'm going to give the opportunity to my guests um, who are here this evening to introduce themselves. So I'll start from my left over to yourself. Okay. You just want to give a quick introduction about yourself. Okay, I'm Rihanna Begum. I live in Solihull, married with two children. I'm a senior financial accountant, currently contracting for the Ministry of Justice. That's the government um, offices are based in London, but work from home. And basically, my background's always been finance work. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And over to yourself, here on my right. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Nazrin Akhtar. I'm currently working for Coventry University as a student recruitment specialist. I've been in my role for about four years now. Um, I travel across the country offering information, advice and guidance to our young students to hopefully make the best decision for their life in terms of um, education and career goals. Hey, thank you for that. So what I'm picking up from our guests and so um, inshallah what that means is that we can really bring some interesting conversations to the show. Um, you've both, you know, you're on a career path. Um, sounds like you've done a lot. Sounds like you meet a lot of young people. Yeah. Um, and so hopefully um, what we'll get is like a really good understanding in, in, in into your own personal lives and then surrounding um, the work that you do. So just to go into a bit, like it's really important that we use this platform here today to talk about and encourage um, the conversation around women empowerment. And we make up half of society so I think it's so important that we talk about um, women and how we can continue to you know be there next to our counterparts in the journey as we advance advance in life so I'm gonna um, I'll start with you Nasrin yeah um, let's talk about being a, a British Bangladeshi woman um, your journey to where you are now yeah you know what kind of challenges if any that you've had to face um, and overcome um, and you know how did you overcome these um, to achieve your own self-empowerment and success? 
Um, okay, so well, growing up, um, I always knew I wanted to go to college. I always mm -hmm. knew I wanted to go to university. However, I didn't know what I wanted to study. Um, and I think it's common within South Asian culture to go into um, popular professions yeah. such as medicine or engineering or business or accountancy. But Alhamdulillah, my parents have never ever dictated um, what to study, where to go. Um, it was always my choice and they've always supported me 100% in what I wanted to do. Um, so just going back to my GCSEs, I chose subjects that I really enjoyed and I excelled in. Um, when I went on to college, I chose subjects that I um, enjoyed at GCSE. I think I chose um, some extra courses that I had never studied before as well. Um, and then my degree, psychology, was based on having thoroughly enjoyed psychology at A-level. And I'm very, very blessed that I was able to go on that educational journey without having a career in mind. I know it's very, very difficult um, for youngsters now to take that risk because it is a huge risk. Um, after my psychology degree, I mean, I started working when I was doing my undergraduate studies. Um, so I was able to do a lot of mentoring, coaching, and um, working with very vulnerable kids with special educational needs at that time. So that kind of helped me understand where I wanted to go for my master's degree and what I wanted my career. Um, uh, kind of what sector I wanted to go into. Um, it was just by sheer luck that after I finished my master's degree, I think it was one day after I completed my course, that I was given a very attractive job offer. C kind of doing what I'm doing right now, um, but with less responsibility um, mm -hmm. and less project leadership. Um, and I had no idea that this career existed, that I could do what I was doing um, essentially as a volunteer you know, in my free time. Um, yeah, so I um, said yes to the job. I've changed um, job roles, um, I think, three, four times in the past six years. So I've worked for different universities, different departments, but it's always been in a university setting. I absolutely love working for a university just because of how diverse it is. And I'm talking about the people that work there as well as the different careers um, available. And um, yep, alongside my career, I also ended up enrolling on a PhD program. I'm studying that part-time. Um, there's a reason why I didn't mention that in my introduction. It's because mm -hmm. it is incredibly stressful, um, especially with you know just being you know coming out of a um, very strict lockdown restrictions, yeah. pandemic, and so on. It has been incredibly stressful, but Alhamdulillah, um, I'm very committed to it. Um, yeah. Do you know that sounds like it sounds really really amazing? Like the journey that you've gone through. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I am going to, um, because one of the things that you talked about was your parents. Yeah. And so what's the message that you would give like, to our parents, the parents that are listening, um, in terms of supporting the journey of empowerment for their daughter? Um, I would say listen to them. I know it sounds like a silly thing to say, but a lot of young girls that speak to me about what course they want to study, they won't necessarily go and tell their parents. They'll ask me to go and tell their parents. So an example um, I can give, so one young girl, she really wanted to study fashion, but her parents wanted her to do business or accountants accounting and finance because those are strong career paths um, but she was incredibly interested in fashion and when she showed me her portfolio and the amount of amazing work she's done um, it took a lot of work for us to um, speak to her parents obviously very respectfully because parents are there to guide you that's their job um, but you know we spoke to her parents on you know numerous occasions and said look this is her dream and um, if you could please support her um, we kind of compromised where she was you know um, supported to um, display her work at festivals, award shows, events and so on. When her parents saw how much interest there was in her artwork mm. and you know that kind of um, like her whole portfolio was on display and she had employers hand their business cards to her, wow. that's when her parents realized you know our daughter is actually really talented and she's got a shot at this. So with her fashion degree she ended up going into um, working for an art gallery and you know still doing her artwork on the side she does a lot of uh, freelance work as well so graphic design so she's almost still doing the business side of things she's got her own um, Instagram business but she's doing what she loves as well uh, with her artwork so 
at the end of the day, her parents got what they wanted. They wanted someone um, who would be very successful in their career. They were, you know, kind of keen on her studying business to end up owning a business, and she's done that with her fashion degree um, and going into like art, textiles. Um, so yeah, I think it's so important to have your parents' support, and it's so important to be able to speak to your parents openly and freely. I think there's a lot of I don't want to say fear because I don't think kids are actually afraid of their parents, but maybe they're afraid to speak to them about their dreams. Mm -hmm. um, I said this to you before, my parents are my best friends. I tell them everything, um, maybe a little bit too much, but I don't know who else I would go to who would not judge me and listen to me and support me because your parents are your first um, role models, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. So you know, as parents who are listening, um, a big part of the journey to empowering your daughter, because the conversation today, uh, we're not marginalizing the boys or the men um, in the conversation, but the conversation today is around empowering women. So, you know, to listen and also what I'm picking up from what Nasreen is saying is that, you know, sometimes we have, um, particularly the, the kind of like the, the, the cultural generation that we're part of pre previously is certain conventional, you know, roots like law, medicine, engineering. And I am going to come to accounting, <laughs> right? Um, but there are other options, there are other dreams. And Nasreen yourself, you've discovered a career that you didn't know existed. Um, so, you know, listening and creating that safe space for your child, for your daughter to be able to share their dreams with you openly. Um, over to yourself. So I'm just going to repeat the question as a reminder. So challenges that you faced um, as a British Bangladeshi woman on your journey to where you are. And I just want to, like, before I give you the chance to speak, I just want to say that it's really interesting because we've, we've uh, moved around in same spaces, interacted in certain events together, and I had no idea what you do until actually um, today pre-show when we had a, a conversation, had a discussion. So I'm really excited to introduce you to our uh, to our viewers today. So over to yourself. Okay. Um, well, since the age of 16, my background's always been finance. I started from the bottom for our listeners. Um, didn't go to college after school. Um, obviously, that was due to the background I grew up grew up in it was like straight after school no college go off get married kind of yeah, thing. yeah and we're, we're from an era actually where once you finished school that was it yeah you know you you finished school and there wasn't that um, it wasn't like uh, a common thing that was happening with a girl will then go on to college go on to university and establish a career because that's the, the generation that time, yeah. an era from from so back back to yourself yeah. so so then I then decided after a couple of years break I decided I started to work full-time and in finance and then I decided I'm going to go back to college and do some part-time study so all the study I've done I've done BTEC courses in um, finance um, and management I've done a HNC, I went on to a HND, I went on to do part of a degree, then I did a master's, I've done um, most of my SEMA papers, I've got a few strategy papers left to do, and now, and that was going back to 2005, and then during lockdown, I'm going to go to lockdown now, during lockdown I decided I want to achieve something during lockdown, come out of lockdown with something, so I thought my master's was back in 2000, between 2003 and 2005. So I decided I wanted to do a PhD, like Nasreen said. So I thought I had because I had a long gap in study. So I went to do an MSc appealed to me. I was online searching, googling something. So an MSc in finance and strategy appealed to me. So I thought I'll go to that, do that for two years, and then I'm definitely going on to do my PhD, and I'm going to do it in, in an area within finance. I haven't decided yet what. Depends if I pass this MSc, and inshallah, I should. I've got through half of it now. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. So everyone out there that's listening. Um, education is not something that's old education education will go through with you through your whole life really it's not like oh I've left school and I, and I, and I shouldn't do something or I can't do something it can be done I mean I work full-time I work 45 50 hours and I still and I'm still and I'm still studying as well and it. you're a full-time mom I'm, and I'm a full-time mom yeah. with two children and, two young, and, and, two young and, children and the husband needs to be looked after as well <laughs> I need to say yeah. that on air because they'll be listening. Absolutely, at some point. absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So at the, currently, I work for the government, um, for the justice system, and um, basically, 
we have a new Prime Minister, Dominic, well, Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab, so basically he's back office at the moment. That's who I work for. So please, um, and my background is accountancy. Anybody needs any advice, please do come forward. Um, it was a struggle at first to get into everything. It, it still is, but you've just got to persevere. persevere. Yeah, sounds like um, we have on my right, like a, 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 a quite a conventional smooth journey into a career path through studies, doing your, you know, you do your GCSEs, you then do your next stage A-levels in university, mm -hmm. and then on this side we've got something that is not the conventional route that you would hear a lot, and there's, it sounds like there was um, possibly like challenges that you faced, a and, lot, yeah. you know, how did you overcome those, like what kind of barriers were presented to you? I, I just, I, I, it was something... It, it was a goal that I wanted to achieve, something I wanted to achieve. I just didn't want to sit back and sit at home. Something I wanted to do for myself, and now obviously it's something I want to do for my children. Um, there's mm -hmm. been challenges, there's been barriers all the way, but you, you, you overcome it yourself. You, don't, you, need to, you need to listen to yourself. You need mm -hmm. to ask yourself why you want to do it, and mm -hmm. then you overcome it, you, you overcome it yourself. Yeah. I mean, everything I've done, I mean, you go, you'll go to work, you get your leaders, you get your people that motivate you. You, do, you listen to them, you also listen to yourself, that's the main thing. Yeah, um, I think um, barriers, like let's have a conversation around barriers of expectations. Mm -hmm. So there's the expectation of the self, yeah. um, there's expectation of family, there's expectation of society, and also an expectation when you're going into to the part by the institution or the workplace, the place where you're working. Have you, have you encountered anything like that, Nasreen? Um, I, I think I've been very blessed that mm -hmm. in terms of education, I didn't face any barriers um, just because like my parents don't come from educated backgrounds like my mom um, same as what was discussed before she was married off when she was 16 um, my dad I think he was 18 17 18 so they married very young um, and you know um, it, it was a struggle for them and I think because they struggled they worked super hard to make sure their children don't struggle um, so education wise um, I've had free reign it was when I started my career um, so like I said before I didn't know this type of career existed mm -hmm. once I started um, going out to events schools colleges to meet with young students I realized that I was the only Bangladeshi female doing this job um, I was the only Bangladeshi doing the job for the first two years, I would say, and then there was a Bangladeshi male colleague at a university down in London um, that was doing the same job role. But yeah, two Bangladeshis in the whole of England doing this kind of work, um, and that's when I realised this is this is a huge barrier because when I'm going out to events. I'm speaking to students that actually want to do something and um, they want to go to college, they want to go to university. Most of the people that I'm trying to access wouldn't be at these events. So that's when I started thinking um, outside the box and that's when I started offering mentoring, coaching, support facilities, either going out to like community meetings, mm -hmm. introducing myself so parents could approach me, mainly mothers who would approach me. Um, I had to brush up on my language skills, like my Bengali was so bad and alhamdulillah marrying um, like my husband's from Bangladesh mm -hmm. and that's when I started learning the language properly, being able to interact with people in the community. Um, so yeah, it's putting myself out there to show show mothers who probably haven't, you know, haven't had experience of a British education system, aren't familiar with what goes on or careers and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that was the biggest barrier, realising that I was the only Bangladeshi doing this kind of job role. Um, but it was also a lot of, I mean, I get nervous very easy. And to then realise that I've got a whole community, almost a whole community looking up to me, that was a lot, you know, a, a mm -hmm. lot of... Um, respect I guess and I'm still a student I'm still studying so sometimes I think you know I'm not where you want me to be but it is scary that people um, see you in such a positive light um, so yeah biggest barrier for me was being the only Bangladeshi doing this um, another barrier I would talk about and again we've spoken about it before and I'm hoping Rihanna can um, elaborate on this is competition yeah. I feel like within our community cousins friends relatives even people who live in the same area their kids are almost made to compete against one another and their kids could be best of friends and if they have a healthy bit of competition amongst themselves like oh let's see who gets the better grade in GCSE English or A level English or whatever that's fine that's amongst them as friends but when parents get involved it's really really um, it's intense and 
you know, kids these days, they already have so much going on. GCSEs are so much more difficult mm. now than they were when I studied my GCSEs. I had to just memorize a textbook and then I went to my exam and it was either multiple choice or write a sentence done. Kids now, they're having to sit all of their exams after two years worth of study. So it's very, very intense. I feel like we need to just forget about the A-star grade. Okay. If your child does not get an A-star grade, it does not mean they are less um, smart than someone who does. There's people that can memorize books in a couple of hours and others that need to take you know, a good few weeks, months to you know, memorize the same content. It does not mean one person is smarter than the yeah. other. So I think competition is definitely another barrier and I think I'm not, I'm not sat here blaming the parents because as parents you know, th they always want the best for the child. Absolutely. So I don't think they realize the negative impact it can have on their ch child. They just want the best for them. But I'm hoping because I'm not a parent. I'm hoping Rohana can yeah, elaborate we'll on come that. come on to that. But I just want to pick up on some really interesting things that you've, you've shared, which is the mothers who are coming to you who haven't been part of the education system here. And we do have a lot, you know, there is a, a large number of Bangladeshi families here in the UK, in Britain, where we have got um, parents who are from Bangladesh. Yeah. So whether it's the mother or the father, and then you're bridging that gap. Because yeah. they don't they haven't been through the education system. They don't understand how the education system works. So when their child is about to finish and go on to higher education you know, what's it going to look like? What's it going to be like? What's the process they mm -hmm. need to go to? And you're filling that, you're kind of like bridging that and bringing that um, the information into the narrative so that they can be part of making an informed decision yes. for their child. Yeah. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Over to you, Rihanna. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are parents nowadays, they have changed. They've come across um, and they just need to listen to their children. You have to, I mean, I listen to my, my son's 12, my daughter's nine. I listen to them now. It's not like... I'm going to listen to him for years. You need to be listening to your child. You need to think about what your child wants. Mm. It's not you. It's like in the old days. Yes, become a doctor, become this, become that. It's what the child's good at. It's what what the child's going to achieve. You can't just blatantly throw it at them and say, "Oh, you've got to become this." Because a lot of our parents do that. Mm. It's a lot of you've got to, you've got to do this. Let's do this. I mean, I've had it in my family where my niece. I talk about my niece. She wanted um, my mom wanted her to go to medical school and. She didn't want to, she wanted to do something else. She kept on telling me. Um, but then COVID kicked in, she learned from that. She went, she now then decided she's going to go to medicine school. And she, Alhamdulillah, she got in, she got a chance yeah. to do that. Because the there's, so, yeah, there's, there's so much more options, I think. And I'll talk about, I'm not excluding you from the conversation <laughs> because you're still very young. Um, but when we were growing up, like, we didn't know there were other options. And like yourself, actually, you can come into the conversation because you've discovered a career that you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. But when we were growing up, it was medicine, law, finance, engineering. Like these were like the buzzwords. These yeah. were the first career words. And if you were able to get into that, then that was almost like a measure of success. Yeah, um, I'll tell you something else. Like there's a couple of incidents that happened. Yes, I'm, I become a doctor, but become an engineer. But they don't, the parents like, they wouldn't have a clue how mm -hmm. to become an engineer and do what's behind becoming an engineer mm -hmm. or what's behind becoming a doctor mm -hmm. but uh, just become a doctor just become an engineer i've had i've had conversations with people with parents of that said no you have to become one have to these kinds of words but it's down to the child and whereas the per the parent didn't know what one what what one mm -hmm. uh, one's education involved so i mean nowadays parents are sorry uh, nowadays parents have moved on and they yeah. do understand a lot more but give it time Definitely. I think things will change in society, but it's just that time barrier. Yeah, and I think success um, has many different shapes to it now, yeah. and faces to it now, mm -hmm. and you know the op the options and the opportunities, and there's more access. There's people like yourself who are gap filling. There's people like yourself who are still studying and motivating, and you know anything is possible. I talk about myself. You know, I was on a, the path to becoming a a, a lawyer, but part way through training. You know, the first time around I got married, divorced, so that, that set me off. Then I came back into the, into the fold of studying law and then I had to um, give it up because I fell ill. And so Sorry, I'm not, I'm going into now humanitarian aid work, which is something completely different. Um, so yeah, so, and, and it's a very fulfilling job being in the humanitarian field of work. It's actually very, very fulfilling. And I have lawyer friends who say to me, you know what, you've been saved. You've actually been saved um, because the work that you're doing now, it's not cutthroat.
So let's move on to, to our next question, keeping our focus on the, uh, the concept around women and empowerment. Um, in your workplaces and from your own life experience, and I don't just talk about in the workplace, society as a whole, um, what have been your insights and experiences into inequality and disempowerment of women? I'll go to you first, yeah. Um, communication. Communication barrier fa failures obviously lead to inequality. Um, mm. And basically, listening. Listening is key. Listening, listening to every, listening to your leaders, listening to your peers, listening to your colleagues, listening to your families. If you don't listen, you're not going to get very far. You need to understand what's going on around you, around society, um, obviously. And then communication. What, I mean, what's your strategy at the end of the day? What's your vision? Get them involved. Understand. Without doing these key things, you're not. There is going to be failure along the way. Mm -hmm. Over to yourself, what have been your insights into um, inequality and mm -hmm. disempowerment of women? I would say it's lack of opportunity. Agreeing with what Rihanna said, I'd add on um, lack of opportunity and lack of knowledge. Um, I don't think women are, and again, I'm not saying it's because of the women, I just think it's like the environment, society, workplaces. I don't think they're aware of exactly what is available. Like I didn't know this was a career and I was doing it as a volunteer in my free time. Um, and lack of knowledge, I feel like, um, like I'm part of a network at work which is called Women's Higher Education Network. The amount of resources that they share in that network I would not have known about. Like mm -hmm. I would not I would not get that information from the workplace, from society, from the community. It's being part of that network that exposes me to all these other um, policies and so on, whatever's happening. So I think as women we do need to be united mm. and I don't think it matters whether you don't have any qualifications or whether you've got a degree or whether you know you've never had a job I don't think that matters I think just the fact that we're all women and we're from the same community that in itself should be worth its weight in gold that should mean more for us to unite and it's just going back to the whole competition thing um, we're all amazing capable women Absolutely. within our own rights I mean um, the viewers have just heard of two very different pathways to success um, someone who's not even had um, this kind of you know pathway that doesn't mean they're not successful I mean in Islam it says a woman is a queen of her home like look at the status of a mother yeah. in Islam as well yeah. so it's just being united and making making sure that, so if I found something out, I would make sure that women within the community knew about it, I'd share that, um, because if I didn't know about it, what are the chances they did? I think we really need to start having conversations about sharing, whether it's opportunities or, you know, like it, when you hear about, um, this is one that I've come across in my uh, mentoring, um, one mother was telling me about scholarship that she wanted me to help um, her daughter apply for, which is amazing, but I knew of at least three other girls that would be eligible for that scholarship but this mother didn't want me to tell the other moms about this scholarship and I you know it, it's, that's not what we should be doing because everything is written by Allah you know so everyone should have equal access yeah. so that was very very um, hurtful because she saw the other girls and the other moms as competition. I was like, well, you shouldn't. We should yeah. all be working together. It's, some, it's something that I heard a few years ago, like, um, they shouldn't. We should be cooperating and encouraging. There's no need for competition, because there's always mm -hmm. room for one and one. Everyone to grow. There's always room for all of us. Um, and, you know, thank you for sharing that, Nasreen. I think as well, like, coming back to what you said about information and sharing, sharing stories, sharing opportunities, um, and really being there to support each other, support. to lift each other up. And I think the other thing that I want to add into the narrative and tell me what your thoughts are on this is about seeking the opportunity and having a seat at the table. Mm. So when there's an opportunity to represent women, to, to represent and put across our voices um, and our needs, taking that opportunity and going forward. Doing it, yeah. And, and doing that, like I myself, you very rarely would hear of in a very typical patriarchal um, after school learning madrasa set up that you've got a woman as a trustee. Mm. But when I was asked to do it, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And through that, we've been able to really put forward what it is that our women want and what they, our young girls need and want from the setup of a madrasa in the community. So it's those kind of things, you know, like you ladies coming here today, you know, the, the seat at the table can look 
like a lot of things, but taking those opportunities where you can come and, and voice and share. Um, because when we don't do that, when we do, you know, when we're not sharing those opportunities, mm. we're disempowering each other as opposed to building, building each other up. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna um, come on to my next question. Um, let's talk about, in your opinion, um, what's the importance of empowerment and how should this look and feel? I know we've shared, shared a lot, but if you could reflect it back to some of your own experience, not just yourself, but what you've seen around you, with family and friends as well, what is the importance of it and you know, how should it look and, and feel? That's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. It's a very good question. Do you have any thoughts? Setting by example, really, mm. is, is, is big, big key. Um, I mean, like you said earlier, some people might not have su been successful, but I'm sure everyone's got an example that they can throw at the table. Mm. So setting by example is key. And it all comes back to communicating and listening, really. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you've got, in our community, you get a lot, oh, we're not going to listen to that person, we'll listen to that person. But I think everyone needs to take a step back and think that in order to empower our young ladies, our women out there, whether, whether young or old, we have to listen. So let's look at like, your, your experience uh, itself. Like, who are the key people that empowered you? And what was it that they did to empower you on your journey, to give you that support? give you that encouragement to be able to um, to move forward and be like, it's okay, we've got your back. Yeah. There's nothing for you to, to be concerned about. We want you to do well. This is where it's go going to be. So what I'm going to do before you ask that quest answer the question for me, we are coming on to a break. So I'm going to ask our uh, viewers to stay tuned. If you are watching, please do encourage others to join us live. It'll be our live on YouTube. So. Um, be on TV UK. So if you are watching, please share the link and share it with others and let them tune in and um, join us this evening. Yeah. On TV UK for the community by the community. www.beontvuk.com. Dear viewers, the world is changing every day with a new technology. At Beyond TV, we are now introducing for the first time in England live weddings and events straight from the venue and simultaneously from your house as well as broadcasting all around the world. Watch live on the day on our Be On TV Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and website channel with all your family and friends around the world from the comfort of your own home. A great way to join in during COVID restrictions too. To make your day extra special, we can live stream using up to eight 4K cameras with live editing choice of your music and give you the complete edited film by the end of the day. To reserve your exclusive booking with competitive prices, please contact us now on email beyondtvuk at gmail.com, phone 0121 257 7007, mobile 078 one four seven hundred two five two.
Lal Haweli Restaurant at the heart of Walsall. BBC Welsh Curry Award winning chef Abul Hussain presents most unique and amazing tower dishes with many flavours and choices. Eat with your family and friends. A unique dining experience never to be missed. Lal Haweli, a 400 seat capacity restaurant perfect for any small parties and functions. Special seating arrangements for ladies and families with prayer facility inside. Mouth watering tower dishes. Join Tower Festival at Lal Haweli. Lal Haweli, home of Tower. One Midland Road, Walsall. Ay lana, ay lana, gorer shopping kar lana. Shonali supermarket er hoy na tulo na go. Shonali supermarket er. On TV UK for the community by the community www.beontvuk.com Now your host for another half an hour or so in the studio with um, Sister Rihanna and Sister Nastreen. And we're having some really interesting conversations around um, empowerment um, of women and the journeys, just learning through their journeys and their stories about wh where they are now um, in life. And for those of you who are tuned in, please do share our YouTube, um, Beyond TV UK, and also Beyond Beyond Television on Facebook. That's where you can find us live um, to join in, in today's show. So, before the break, I asked you the question about empowerment, and um, you know, your education was at a time where it wasn't it wasn't a done thing or for a young Bangladeshi British woman to go on after finishing her GCSEs to go on into further education and then higher education and pursue a career. Um, as bizarre as it may sound, because today it's quite. We see a lot of young girls finishing their school and going on and parents giving them the supporting and, and the backing. But on your journey, where did that empowerment come from for you, the encouragement, the empowerment the, to continue and carry on and pursuing your dreams parallel to, you know, doing the other things, being being married, having children, having a family, so, yeah. You want to, share? Well, to be honest, I've been blessed, because um, wherever I've worked over the last so many years, um, I've had good directors, good managers, mm -hmm. so they have empowered me to move on, and um, to be honest, I've worked for a lot of large organisations where there's a lot of training courses um, offered, um, motivation in terms of go and do these courses to better yourself in the mm -hmm. job that you do and then the main the main other key is after most of my education has been after i've got married and support from my husband um, if it wasn't for him i wouldn't be doing all these courses i've done and some of the intense exams i've taken um, and my support from home comes first and was it and, and i know this is going to be like you don't need to answer this question if you don't want to but was it, um, did your husband come on board and back you and support you quite easily or did, were there any challenges behind that where you had to um, kind of like, where you had to get him to buy into your dream and your goals and your aspirations? No, he supported me quite well, but whereas I've got um, family friends um, that husbands won't support them, won't allow them to do a course, it's so difficult. I mean, the other day I was speaking to someone back in the US and it's like they can't do anything, they can't move on and it's quite difficult for them. So you still mm. get a lot of that nowadays. Because it's, I want to bring this in and without getting too, too Islamic about it all, there's often in our culture, Bangladeshi culture, and also when they bring Islam um, into it, that what defines a woman is modesty, marriage, and motherhood. Yeah. And if you've got those three things, then you're an amazing, perfect woman. Um, but there's so much more to being a woman, and you know we're seeing this through your through your stories. And there's so much more to the purpose of, of a woman beyond the modesty, beyond the, the marriage, beyond uh, the motherhood. Um, so it's nice to see, um, and you know we only get to see this when we start sitting and talking and sharing stories. And like I said, I had no idea what what you do, and you know like listening to you now and to go you know achieve what you've achieved and you still have the aspiration to go on and do your PhD and that's like inspiring me like you know if, if Rahana can do it then 
Inshallah. I can do it yeah. too, inshallah. Go back and pursue my legal career, maybe one day. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, coming to, to yourself as well, I suppose a similar question, um, because you yourself are, are married um, and working, and I'm not saying that it's not the done thing, but it's not the easiest done thing. Mm. Um, so how how is how is um, the empowerment come for you from from your the, after your because your parents are your biggest supporters by the yeah. sound of being your biggest cheerleaders, mashallah. Um, but how have you found it in terms of the marriage side of things and having the support um, there? Marriage has been, alhamdulillah, it's been a blessing for me because my husband knew from the start that I was a PhD student and he was 100% supportive of my dreams and my career goal. Um, I'm embarrassed to say this live, but alhamdulillah, I've been married five years and I still don't know how to cook because <laughs> my husband takes care of it all. Like, I, I don't... When, when I get home, alhamdulillah, everything's done for me. You know, sometimes I might need to, like, make, I don't know, like, make the rice, and even then I don't know how to do it. I'll just use a rice cooker. Um, I'm sorry for embarrassing my parents, um, but I, I, honestly, I would not be able to have achieved what I've achieved or carry on working the way I work if it wasn't for my husband. Like, I spent most of last week in London, um, and my husband just made sure everything was okay at home. Uh, same for my in-laws as well. There was never an expectation that I would have to leave my studies or I would have to quit my job and they know I travel a lot and you know and most of the times I'm alone and you know it is a worrying thing like my mother-in-law uh, you know may Allah bless her she'll call me when she knows I'm working late and she'll stay on the phone with me until I've walked to my car or until I'm oh. safe and she's in Bangladesh so she stays up just to make sure I get home safe can you imagine and my late father-in-law may Allah be pleased with him um, he's oh. passed away now um, he was the only person in his entire like Habigushti to have a degree and you know he passed away when he was mid 70s so that was a huge thing for him like in his generation um, you know I, I'm not very good at math so I can't even tell you what year he was born in but I'm just gonna say 1930s or whatever um, but to have a you know to be Bangladeshi Bangladeshi born and to have a degree that was a huge huge thing mm. and you know he's been my biggest supporter as well like he's always supported me and whenever he used to speak he'd always ask me about my studies and how work is going so Alhamdulillah I'm incredibly blessed incredibly blessed to have had that support at home however similar to Rihanna I have friends who after marriage they have had to quit their studies or quit their job um, one of my friends it breaks my heart to say this but she was a second year nursing student and all she ever wanted to become was a nurse mm. and she got married um, during the second year of her studies and then she dropped out after one semester and you know she said it was her decision but it it makes you ask yourself was it really her decision like, I knew her from you know many years and all she ever said was she wanted to be a nurse and she persevered and did all of her work experience and so on and then after marriage she wasn't able to complete her degree she only had a year so I don't know what the issue was whether it was a degree or whether it was a career path I don't know but she she had to give up her dreams and I don't think that's fair because there's a lot of expectation on women to make sacrifices mm. and women to make the compromises and I'm not entirely sure who set that tone where it's come from because women you know they can accomplish everything you know you can be married and have a successful career and have a family yes, a beautiful fa a beautiful family you can have it all it's just managing time and having the support at home I mean like I said I, I can't cook my husband also works full-time he might cook once a week but my mom will cook curries for me and my husband and will pick it up on the way home like having that support and you know like honestly I'd be nothing without my parents my parents are not only my best friends my you know biggest supports I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for my parents if it wasn't for my husband and my in-laws because the amount of support they've given me it's been invaluable listening to you thank you for sharing that listening to you it says it, it takes an entire village to raise a child mm. and even when that child is married it still takes an entire village to continue that child their dream um, their passion and their desire everything um, and I know what you've shared and there are some women who want to who, who want to don't want to pursue work mm. or uh, you know studies or anything like that and that's absolutely fine yeah but the narrative that we're having you know today is around those who want to and what you described to me is really beautiful because it's a partnership mm. you know that you have um, with your husband 
I think it should definitely be a choice whether you mm. want to go out to work or whether you want to stay at home yeah. and look after your beautiful children. So long as it's your choice mm -hmm. and it's not an imposed choice, I think that's the most important thing because mm. we're not here slating housewives. Like Absolutely they are the queen not. of the house. Yeah. Like I could never compare myself to someone who can cook, clean, look after children, and basically be a CEO of their house. Like that's an incredible, incredible time management organization mm. skills. Like I, I could never. Inshallah, I'll reach that stage. So I'm not here saying, you know, if you stay at home, you're not as good as someone with a career. No. Mm. For me, it's just so important that it's their choice and yeah. they've chosen that life for themselves rather than it being imposed on them. And that's empowerment. Yeah. When you're able to make that choice for yourself and see that choice through um, with the support, whatever it is that you decide, that, that in itself there for me is one of the definitions of empowerment. Um, over to yourself. What are your thoughts on anything that Nasreen shared with us? Um, I, I totally agree to what Nasreen says, but one, one thing is um, I think in-laws need to understand what empowerment is and that support they need to give because I find a lot of girls that can't study or take their career anywhere forward is they say when they get married, oh, they can do this, they can do that, and then afterwards it's all like, no, you can't do anything kind mm -hmm. of thing. But I think it's a big, it's a key word for in-laws to understand when someone comes into your house, give them the opportunity to help them through it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and give them that, that, that support and yeah. and you know nurture the space and the environment that they're in yeah. for them. Yeah, um, I want to touch on something um, just while we were off air on the conversation around taking the seat at the table. Okay, yeah. um, and you know, if you want to just share with our viewers yeah. your experience with taking the seat at the table. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, I'm a trustee for a charity called, called Solo who helps um, adults and children with learning disabilities. Now I know out there, um, a lot of our community, there is um, a lot of same children. A lot of same children, a lot of adults. It, yeah, which is special educational needs, needs yeah. yeah. The aspect sometimes will be picked up in the child's um, school life, sometimes it's picked up later on in life, but I just wanted to air the fact that there is charities out there to help um, if you need it, if, if there was, because a lot of our people don't go forward until it's actually found by somebody else, but a lot of our families and parents need to understand if there is an issue with your child, you need to come forward. There's health officers, there's nurses, there's doctors, there's so many people out there in the community that you can talk to. I mean, this trust, this um, charity that I'm a trustee for um, on their board, um, things like that. Anyone wants any help, I can, I can take them forward and they offer a lot of support. Thank you. Let's talk about your, how you became a trustee there because um, I know, with, especially with like um, the, um, the non-Bangladeshi kind of like charities, etc. It's really difficult to get a seat at the table, to be at a trustee level, to be on a board level where you're you're taking part in decision making, you're influencing decision making. Yeah. So how how did you come about getting into this? Role? I um, because of my background and my skill set, I thought I needed to use it and volunteer and use it elsewhere. So I contacted a charity based in Surrey, although part of uh, Macmillan. Macmillan cancer charity, I contacted them and I also contacted a charity called Carver, both based in Solo because I wanted to do something in the community, in the area I live in. So both of them, when they had my CV and looked at my skill set, they approached me straight away. And I had a couple of interviews, well, quite a few interviews to get onto the, this board, but I thought it's, it's a key charity and I needed to take my skills And, to and what's the representation like that, like there in terms of um, ethnicity, gender. Um, I'm the only, I'm, I'm the only Asian on on the trustee board for that particular charity. There's no other Asians that've been on that board. And how does that make you feel? I make, makes me feel proud to be Bangladeshi and be be on their board. And I hope over the next so many months of working with them, I can bring um, a lot to their table. And this is where I want to show you because when we empower. Um, the talent and we recognize the talent that we have in our community amongst our women and we encourage them in the early part of their career as they grow in their career as they grow in their confidence their skills their experience they're able to then take seats at tables that are going to influence decision making and have an effect on our future generation and I think that's so important because we, sometimes we don't look at the bigger picture. We don't look at, mm. like, you know, what can this young girl, what can this woman, what can this mother, what can this daughter-in-law, you know, 
what can they go on to be and what difference and impact can they have on society as a whole and I think we don't look at the bigger picture just as we're so focused in on no there's just this we can't mm -hmm. we've got to zoom out sometimes and look in and um, yeah that can be a, 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 a kind of like a way of finding that motivation to empower I'm also on um, part of our, my local doctor's parent, um, patient participation group where we sh they share things that have gone on experiencing with the doctor's surgery issues, um, staffing issues, etc. It's like a board. So basically I'm part of that. But that has, I've learned a lot from the last year being on that board and COVID mm -hmm. and how families interact and things that have happened. So that's another great experience I can bring. And another one that I asked I think there was a flyer somewhere. I seen mm. and I thought there's a lot of skills I can bring to the table. A lot of leadership goes into their meetings. So. Mm. You I remind me of the phrase where it says, if there is no seat at the table, bring your own chair and make yeah. your own seat. So that's exactly what you've just described. Yeah. Alongside a 50 hour job maybe a week. Mm. And these two. Um, yeah. And, and you know, that it's, it's just so nice. Like honestly, I can't explain to you how nice it is to listen to these kind of stories because, you know, we are already like a minority by the, you know, not just by our faith, by the the ethnic eth um, ethnic background that we're part of, and being Roman, we're already part of so many disparities. And then when you hear stories like this of how, you know, you it it, it hasn't, it wouldn't have been easy, no. and to overcome those and then to get that seat whether it's your own chair that you've pulled up and said, mm. hey, I'm going to be sitting here. Um, but yeah, it's really nice to hear that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to come on. I'm going to throw this question in, right? Okay. So be off guard a bit, because I didn't put this in, in, in the brief that I sent you. But celebrating women and celebrating young girls and celebrating the successes, like, do you see those? Do you do those? Should we do them more? How should we do them? Why should we do them? Definitely yeah. Because I don't think things are being celebrated enough out there. It just did not have the community. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Like just thinking back to like when I was <coughs> a teenager achieving my educational achievements, like my dad was super proud and he was just happy with whatever I was doing. But I realised like with his friends and other people in the community, if their child, and I'm going back to the A-star thing because I have a big issue with it, um, mm -hmm. if their child did not get an A-star, they didn't think it was worthy to tell people of their, you know, of their child's results. And for me, that's disheartening because yeah. so long as someone has really tried their best, that should be more than enough. That's so true. In your best and my best, are completely, completely different. different. And then, like, your ability and my ability are completely different, mm. but we can still achieve success, but this, our success is going to look different. And I think this is really, really important. We don't celebrate enough. Mm. We don't, because we don't do it, our young girls don't do it. No. As women, they don't do it. We need to redefine exactly what success means. Mm -hmm. It does not mean A-star grades. It does not mean having a degree. I mean, I've got several successful cousin-in-laws that, didn't go to university after their um, college course and they're earning more than me you know so we we definitely need to have a conversation where we redefine success and it's a very individual personal thing and, and another, another thing, thing I have a problem with, with is people thinking that if you don't go to university after you finish college that you can never return that is not yes. the case Definitely. I think <laughs> I think the oldest person that you know I've seen enrolled at university was 91 Wow yeah. And when I studied my degree, 18-year-olds were a min minority. The vast majority of um, students that were on my degree were 30s, 40s. So if you know your child does not go to university at age 18 because they don't know what they want to study, that's absolutely fine. It does not mean that they haven't achieved success. It's very important, especially now with tuition fees being you know, over £9,000 a year. It's so important that if they do go to university, it benefits them and their career, not because they have to, because they're 18. Or because it's an expectation of society, you know, um, like you, you get told, you know, mm -hmm. you have to, and it's that societal pressure that you put on. And it's so important to redefine, um, have a conversation around what success means and um, 
it's got to be individual. It's a very individual thing, and dreams and aspirations are a very, very um, individual thing. And yes, we take inspiration from things that are around us. And yes, it will change. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you want to. I always wanted to be a surgeon. I don't know where law came from. You know, but it happens. And then the law was taken away from me. Now I want to be a humanitarian. And it's like it's forever changing because we're always changing as people, and things around us are changing. Things around us are influencing and. So yeah, that was um, that's an interesting conversation. So whenever you get the next opportunity, um, please do celebrate and, and celebrate. Can it, it, there's no particular way to celebrate, but yes, please do do that. Um, I, I'm going to throw in one question, last question. If we can just quickly um, wrap up our answers on it, how do you think um, British Bangladeshi women can get involved to improve um, betterment and sustainable development of the British Bangladeshi community here in the UK? How do we feel? Like yeah. Involved? How do you think women can get involved to be part of? I suppose to put it in a in, in a nutshell, be a part of the bigger narrative and the bigger picture here in um, in in Britain. Um, shall I this one? Yeah. I think they need to be more open. Mm -hmm. They um, need to be more open and ask for guidance of where they can go. Mm -hmm. And without, it, I mean, it's like it's almost like if you're if you're going to have a secret and not tell people what you do, where you do it, no one's going to empower you. No one's going to know. Mm -hmm. um, you you need to come forward. Basically, the main thing is you need to be open. You need to come forward. Thank you, Tisa. I would say. Um, supporting one another so you know I do a lot of coaching mentoring advising and you know offering advice and guidance to a lot of young students I think that's something we need to do as well like making sure that British Bangladeshi women that are in you know successful positions whatever success means to that individual they need to be reaching out to the community and making sure that people can find them on LinkedIn social media and having those conversations mm. because when I was growing up it was very um, difficult to find a British Bangladeshi woman that I could look up to mm -hmm. um, there was only one woman in my entire family that had a master's degree and you know unfortunately she's passed now but so now I'm the only woman with a master's degree. How scary is that? Yeah. So we need to try and be more accessible and try and offer mentoring, coaching, supporting, even just a listening ear. Um, so the young generation know that they can, um, I don't want to say use us, but I think you know what I'm trying Have to say. Have access to you, yeah. yeah. So they can use our it, success and even yeah. our mistakes. We've made a lot of mistakes yes. in our career, in our education journey that will be a valuable source of information and you know guidance for someone who is about to embark on that career or yeah, yeah. Um, on that path. Now that reminds me of a recent um, social media post that I saw. It's a young um, medical. She's, she's, she's completing her her um, rounds of the med in, in, uh, in the hospital at the moment. So she's very close to completing. And she put a post saying that anybody who wants help with completing your application to get into medicine, let me know. I'll be happy to sit down and talk you through the whole process mm -hmm. so that's that's really good thank you ladies so much for taking the time out um, to be with us we are coming to the end of the show I hope our viewers have enjoyed today and taken you know even if you've taken one thing away and even if we can make an impact on one person's life for us that's huge huge achievement thank you very much for for listening and please do subscribe um, to be on TV UK on YouTube and also be on television on Facebook Thank you very much and Asalaamu Alaikum and good evening. Be on TV UK for the community by the community. www.beontvuk.com
लाना जाई लाना घोरे शॉपिंग कर लाना शोनाली सुपरमार्केट तेरे होए ना तू लो ना गो शोनाली सुपरमार्केट तेरे होए ना तू लो ना शोनार बांगलार ताजा शब्जी मीठा पानीर माँस बच्चर घूरे शोधा कोरो याचे मुल्लो राश ओल तमर बार मिंगा में शोनाली सुपरमार्केट में घूरे एक बारा शोना शोनाली सुपरमार्केट तेरे होए ना तू लो ना गो शोनाली सुपरमार्केट � Shunali Supermarket, Lodges Road, Birmingham. On my Aptachar Abichar, Radniti, Orthoniti, Shanskiti, Dharmoti, Timbadoniti. Fashangi Kayo, Neomer Jale, Japashangi. Japni Boltechan, Abra Boltechan. A shopper, Shamashai Prakapot me, after the Shoshi on Sagahone, Amiriada, beyond to be for the Ashi, Notunustani, Amyo Boltechai. Abra Bolben, Ambashunbo. Riyadha Hathe Shanchalonai, Community Nana Bishoy Nye, Bhinnu Matrar Onushthan, Aamiyo Bolte Chai. Dekhun, Poti Shaktahe, Shudhu Matro, Beyond TV Te, Pujijanai, Shipon Ahmed. Beyond TV UK, for the community, 